Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Tobias Gerstenberg. He is an assistant professor of psychology at Stanford University, where he leads the Causality in Cognition Lab. His research is focused on higher level cognitive phenomena such as causal inference and moral judgment. And today we're talking about causal cognition, how basically people think about causality and how it connects to attributions of moral responsibility. So Dr. Gerstenberg, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to everyone. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> so let me start with perhaps a basic question. So what is causal cognition? I mean, as a psychologist, when you study this phenomenon, what are you really interested in? What kinds of questions do you usually tackle? Yeah, so I think there's at least sort of maybe two aspects to, to the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. One of which being is that, you know, causal cognition partly studies how people think about causality in the world. And but then it also relates to how causality shapes the way that we think, right? And so when thinking about the world, I think it's sort of useful to maybe delineate like three different areas like of causal cognition. Um, there's the area of causal learning. So that's how we learn about the causal structure of the world. And might also be just how we learn about the relationship between particular variables, right? This could be like um, figuring out whether some you know, drug actually cures diseases or not, um, but also learning more complex things like how how several you know, variables or phenomena in the world are related to one another or how certain kind of causal mechanisms work. And that can be studied from a developmental perspective, how children learn about the causal structure of the world. But even for adults, we do causal learning often as we encounter new you know, domains, play new games or something like that. So then as a second area, there's the area of um, causal reasoning. Right there, the idea is, okay, we already know now to some extent how the causal world works. And how do we now use that knowledge um, to be effective in the world, right? And that could be things like predicting what's going to happen in the future. It could be things like making inferences about what may have happened in the past, like a detective who comes to a crime scene and now wants to figure out, okay, what happened, right? Given the kind of evidence that they're seeing. Um, and it could also be things like thinking about how things could have played out differently from how they actually did, like sort of reasoning, you know, counterfactually and, and planning and taking good actions. Those are all things that... Um, causal reasoning um, relates to. And then there's also like um, a, a separate area maybe, and that's the area that I've maybe mo most focused on in my research. And that's how we um, make causal judgments and how we give explanations of what happened, right? So when there is, you know, some phenomenon that come, came about and often there might be multiple factors that contributed to it. How do we decide when somebody asks us, okay, why did this happen? How do we give explanations to those kinds of questions? So, so those are sort of separate areas of causal cognition, I would say, right? Causal learning, causal reasoning, and causal judgment. And then another separate area, but I'm not sure that it falls within causal cognition, is causal perception, right? That's just how we sometimes get the impression that we can really um, quite immediately perceive causal events in the world, right? If we see like, you know, two billiard balls kind of colliding on a screen, we have the sense if they have the right sort of structure to this collision that we can directly see that, yeah, that, that first one caused the second one to move. Um, but there's a little bit of a discussion and or quite a bit of a discussion in cognitive science um, about the relationship between, you know, perception and cognition. So that's why I'm not quite sure whether I should put it into the, the, the field of causal cognition, but it's another area to do with causality that people in, in psychology and cognitive science are very interested in. But what, what is causality exactly from a psychological perspective? What does it mean to attribute causality to something, to an event or something like that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question also. And it's probably something that at least I've also taken inspiration from work in philosophy, right? So because they are also we, you know, very interested often in the metaphysical questions, right? That the sort of what it is, right? And then maybe I'll talk a little bit about that and then kind of maybe what it is from a psychological perspective. So the inspiration for me from the philosophical literature has been that there were these um, two large uh, and different kind of frameworks for how people um, have thought about kind of what causality is. And there's one kind of um, framework of theories that are sometimes called um, process um, theories of causation. And, and for them, what causality really is, is a sort of some transfer of some quantity. Again, if you think about kind of billiard ball collisions as the sort of paradigmatic case of causality, so what it means there for something to have caused another is that this one ball uh, 
um, transferred some kind of quantity, maybe like momentum, you know, to the other ball, and that's what made it move, right? And so this kind of thinking about causation is very uh, well suited, you know, to thinking about the physical world, but sometimes a little bit less clear of how we would apply such a notion of causation to other kind of more complex phenomena, like, you know, the economy, or even when people, you know, um, do things in the world, and maybe when, you, when it's their thoughts that cause their actions, it's not so clear how this more force-based or process-based model could explain those kinds of phenomena. Then there's another camp of thinking about causation, also from philosophy, that I call sometimes more like dependence theories of causation. And then, so, and the basic idea is, or what it means for something to cause the other thing is that these things are dependent on each other in a particular kind of way, right? And then different um, dependence theories characterize what this dependence means in different ways. And I'll just highlight one of them because it's the closest to home for me. And that's what's called a counterfactual theory of causation. And what that basically says, so in simple terms, is to say, well, what does it mean for A to have caused B, let's say, to happen? Right? It's to say that B would not have happened if A had not happened. And it's a more kind of um, generic notion of, um, of counterfactual dependence that's also sometimes then um, kind of fleshed out in more particular ways. And we can talk about that in a moment. That's what's called like an, an interventionist framework. So that and says like, oh, what it really means to cause something is to say like, well, if I did something about this first thing, something to the second thing would happen, right? If I, if I were to wiggle in A, something should happen to B. Um, and what's appealing about this notion of causation is that it's kind of much more uh, general. And you could see how that could also apply to something like an economic system right? we might, where we might ask like, oh, you know, did the Lehman Brothers, the fall of the Lehman Brothers back then cause the financial crisis? We could at least sort of entertain this counterfactual of what would have happened if they had been bailed out and what could have happened to the financial system. So it's in some sense a more flexible notion of thinking about causation that can apply to a variety of um, uh, of phenomena. And, and that view of causation has also been quite popular, I would say, in, in psychology. And so when it comes to the sort of counterfactual model of causation, what do we need that for? I mean, why do we need to imagine particular scenarios that might have happened? Because if they might have happened, but didn't happen, why does that matter to us psychologically? Yeah, no, that's a great question too. So, and and, um, and and I should say again, in philosophy, that's what some um, some philosophers don't like counterfactuals because they say they have this kind of yeah metaphysically dubious status. Let's say, just as you put it, like oh, why should it matter if something that you know never really mattered, right? That that or that never really happened because that's, yeah. that's kind of in the word right of the counterfactual. It's counter to fact. It did not happen, right? And so. Um, and and maybe I'll build it up a little bit that an, the answer to that question if you know if, if that's okay. So first of all, yeah, what is what is a counterfactual? Right, a counterfactual, um, at least when we think about you know from a psychological perspective, is a thought about something that you know didn't happen and thinking about how um, maybe it could have happened differently from how it actually did and what the consequences of that would have been. Right? Mm -hmm. And so now you ask kind of, you know, what's, what that's useful for, right? And so, so they all take kind of inspiration from um, Judea Pearl, who is a, you know, Turing Award winning um, uh, computer scientist. Um, and, and he's delineated what he calls like a ladder of causation, a ladder like the kind of ladder that you climb on, you know, when you try to go up the, um, go up somewhere. In this case, the ladder only has three rungs, so it's a short ladder. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, 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 and what he puts is like that the kind of causal knowledge that we, that we have about the world can be characterized by these um, different rungs on the ladder. And on the first rung is what, what he says, he puts the, um, the level of you know, correlation. And, and sometimes that can also be sort of thought of as the kind of you know, conditional reasoning that we can do about the world, sort of like, you know, if A, then B, right? And, um, and correlations are really helpful for making predictions about the world and making inferences about the world. But we probably also, you know, many of us may have learned from their, you know, stats classes or in school that, that you know, um, correlation doesn't equal causation, right? And just to give sort of an intuitive example maybe of what that means. So imagine that, you know, you have the flu and there's like two symptoms that you have from the flu, right? You, and it causes you to have a fever and it also um, causes you to have a, a cough, let's say. Um, but we now happen to know the causal model of that, right? That it's sort of, you know, the flu that causes the fever and that causes the cough. But maybe you, maybe let's say you didn't know, you just had these three different variables and all you had was like information about how they co-occur over time, 
right? Just correlational information. So just based on that, for example, um, you could be inclined to think that it's actually, you know, the cough that causes um, the fever or that it's the fever that causes the cough um, or that like, um, you know, the fever causes the flu or something like that, right? So because you can say like, oh, if I have a cough, then I have a fever. Um, so the correlations in themselves doesn't give, they give some hints about possible causal relationships, but they don't give it away, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the first rung, right? It's just like being able to observe correlations in the world that help us make um, predictions or make inferences from one thing to another. On the second rung is then the level of causation. And, um, and the key difference between um, thinking causally and thinking just in terms of, um, um, you know, well, conditionally or correlations between events is that um, causes support interventions. Right? The idea is now to say like, well, if I know that is a causal structure and I know that A causes B, let's say, or that the, um, that the flu in this case causes the fever, I know that if I want the fever to stop, I have to do something about the flu, right? But if I want um, the flu to stop, uh, intervening in the fever is not really gonna be helpful, right? That might, you know, again, cure a symptom, but it's not gonna cure the cause of the disease, right? So by being able to distinguish between, um, yeah, these kind of, interventions and and other just sort of correlational relationships, we get this distinction between the rung one and rung two. And, and that's often like much of the sciences sort of stay there in these two things. That's often all we can do, even in like, you know, in psychology, we can do randomized controlled trials. And that's essentially sort of the the rung two thing, right? We kind of intervene by randomly assigning one group of people to the treatment and the other people not to the treatment. And then as an outcome of that, we get like a difference between the two that tells us something about, you know, whether there is some um, yeah, difference that the, that the cause makes. Um, but then on the third level, like, and so that's not enough, right? There's a third level, and that's the level according to um, um, Pearl of counterfactual reasoning or the level also um, at which we give explanations. And this is answering kind of why questions, like why did something happen, right? And and maybe if we go back to this example of the um, you know of the um, of the of the randomized control trial, right? So let's say you you do this, you 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 know have, have twenty participants, um, um, you put twenty of them in the in the in the group without a treatment, and then let's say kind of ten you know feel good afterwards and ten don't, right? And then you put uh, 20 people in the group um, with the treatment. And now, you know, 16 people um, feel good afterwards and, and four people don't, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that gives you some sense that like, okay, overall, there is an, an average effect like of that treatment, right? It seems to people are better with it than, than they are um, without it. Maybe with these small numbers, you wouldn't really, you would still be a little bit unsure, but that was just, you know, for the example. But ultimately, you might now take the perspective of one of the people, maybe one of the 16 people in the, in the treatment group, and they now ask themselves, did I actually get better because of the treatment? And that's a kind of actual question in some sense, right? Because it's sort of asking from that person's perspective, had I not gotten the treatment, would I not also have been good, right? It's sort of basically asking the question, was the treatment the cause of me getting better? Right. And there's many possible combinations that could arise for this difference, right? It could be like actually the treatment, you know, helped some people who would have otherwise been worse. But it's also possible that there's a small proportion for whom the treatment was actually bad. You know, they would have been, you know, better off. Maybe some of these four people who had got um who, you know, didn't didn't have a good outcome, maybe a few of them would have been good had they not gotten the treatment, right? So in some sense, right, like coming back now to the question what the counterfactuals are useful for, they're ultimately the kind of thing that we want to uh, rely on when giving explanations, when answering why questions. And my, my colleague here at Stanford, um, Thomas Eichert in philosophy and his um, student, um, Dalega Ebeling, have sort of also put it in this way, saying, so the difference between level one and two is sort of, you know, correlation is not causation. And then the difference between level two and three is also saying causation is not explanation. So just having causal knowledge of the world is not enough necessarily to give explanations of why something happened. And that's often what we are in psychology interested in. Like, you know, why did this crime happen? Who was it? Uh, why did they do it? And, and that's what we need kind of actual reasoning for. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, in people's daily lives, I guess that it's not very of, often that we have access or can do randomized control trials. Right? That's right, so, yeah. So I guess that 
when it comes to learning about specific causes behind specific events, taking into account that uh, sort of interventionist approach, that's also something that people many times rely on to learn about or try to infer as best as possible what causes a particular thing to happen. Right. That's right. Yeah. And and it's true that, you know, we randomly, oh, sorry, rarely find ourselves in the position to to do such a randomized controlled trial, right? We, we yeah. certainly do experiment, you know, with ourselves, like in our everyday lives, like we say, like, oh, you know, you have an upset stomach and you might, you might change around what it is that you eat, right? But it's kind of hard, right? Also to trace back the causality uh, in those kinds of cases. And they're never as clean, let's say, as the randomized controlled trials are, because, Part of one important thing is that there's a, a high causal dependence, right, between me yesterday and me today and so on that you can kind of break when um, when doing RCTs. And But on the other hand, you know, we often already have quite good um, what I and, and, and others in, in, in psychology have called like intuitive theories of how the world works, right? We have good kind of intuitive theories about how the physical world works, right? How, yeah. you know, objects interact um, uh, with each other and, you know, make stuff happen. Again, could be in billiard balls world, but like, you know, all, all, lots of sports are good examples for how good, you know, our intuitive theories and how impressive, you know, they, they can be. Um, and similarly, we have good intuitive theories about psychology, about how people work, right? And so those are then things that we can draw on um, to try and give answers to those why questions, mm -hmm. right? If I want to, um, and and the law, for example, also often, you know, asks jury members, you know, to do so. It asks them to apply different kind of counterfactual tests, for example, when when establishing, you know, causation. So it sometimes asks mm -hmm. them to say like, okay, you know, was the action that the defender took, was that the cause of the, of the negative outcome? Would it not have happened had they not done that? Um, and, and similarly, they might ask something like whether a reasonable person would have, um, you know, acted the same way as the defender did in a particular situation. That's also quite a sophisticated counterfactual test, right, where we now have to imagine putting that reasonable person into that situation and then sort of running in our minds, like how this whole situation would have unfolded if the reasonable person, whoever that is, would have been in the same situation, right? But our capacity to have these uh, mental models of the world and to make changes in them in our minds, right? Where the intervention is not actually happening in the real world in some sense, right? The intervention is just happening in my mind. And, but because I have this structured knowledge of the world, I'm capable of doing that. I'm capable of imagining how would the scene have unfolded if some object had not been there and then simulating the consequence of that in my mind and thereby kind of put, give a potential answer to the question of whether it happened, you know, because of that. So it's also useful because it allows for us to, at least to a certain extent, acquire further knowledge about how things work, even without necessarily having to try them out. Also, because I would imagine that in particular instances, it wouldn't be feasible or it could even be dangerous, depending that's on right. what we're talking about. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I, and I think that's right. And that's still like, I would also say a really sort of, deep puzzle, I think, that hasn't been um, solved and that's I've been sort of mulling over for some time. And I'll, I'll maybe try to give a hint of, you know, what the puzzle here is, at least, because um, um, as you put it, right, it, it um, and there's several frameworks that also say that, but more kind of, um, you know, conceptual theories, maybe theories that haven't really been worked out in concrete detail yet computationally, but where the idea is that, yeah, I learned something like through doing these counterfactual simulations, right? Um, and, and intuitively, we, we, we might often sense that, right? We might say like, oh, I did something, it turned out poorly, I regret it, right? And even the feeling of regret already is a counterfactual emotion, right? Because it's basically saying, you know, what does it mean to feel regret? Well, it means that I feel like I could have done something different and I believe that doing something different would have resulted in a better outcome, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, the curious thing about um, that being a signal to potentially learning about the world is that in order to um, compute you know, what the counterfactual is, I need to use my intuitive understanding of how the world works, right? Yeah. So if that's wrong, right? Let's say I have the wrong theory about how you know, the physical world works or about how somebody would have done. When I now simulate that counterfactual, I'm not getting the correct answer, right? I'm just getting like an incorrect answer that's based on my theory. So it's kind of curious a little bit 
um, how it is that we can learn from that, right? Because it feels like in order to simulate it, I need my theory of how the world works. But if my theory is wrong, I'm going to simulate the wrong thing. So how could I learn from that? So it's a little bit like the, you know, the cat um, biting itself in its tail and, um, uh, or the snake. I don't know who, what animal bites itself in its tail. but <laughs> um, And so that's still like a, a puzzle because on the one hand, it feels like, yeah, it serves as a learning signal. But on the other hand, it's also not quite clear how that could be the case. So so that's still something that we as cognitive scientists have, have to figure out. But when it comes to the intuitive ideas or models of the world that we have, that you mentioned yeah. there, do we have any idea if some of those intuitions are innate to us or if they are the result of some development and learning? I mean, is it that we are born with certain psychological predispositions to expect things to be in a certain way when it comes to the physical world, other people? And if so, would that connect in any way to what some psychologists and anthropologists study and call a core knowledge. There is folk yeah. physics, folk psychology, and so on. Yeah, yeah, those are deeply connected. You're you're exactly right. I'm I'm you know not a developmental psychologist myself, mm -hmm. although I dabble in it and take you know inspiration from it. And um, and there's certainly this idea also coming back to causality, right? Like I mean, like Immanuel Kant also famously says that that's just like that's a sort of a core principle like a, um, and then later you know we re rediscovered or just like reworded is that people think like yeah that's just a basic building block of thinking we can't help but think causally that's just sort of how our mind works right and then with respect to these um kind of folk theories or intuitive theories how they're sometimes called in cognitive science um yes there is um, a lot of work looking specifically also like into uh, as you mentioned um um um, infant's intuitive theory of, of the physical world and infant's intuitive theory of, you know, um, the, the psychological world, the social world. And there are certain principles that come, you know, very early in age, right? Like, um, so really almost like, I don't remember, you know, how young, how, how, how many months the children have to be like for a while, like, you know, Jean Piaget famously also thought that it took a while for children to, um, or for, you know, yeah, young babies uh, to realize um, object permanence, right? It was the idea like, oh, if it's not, you know, out of sight, out of mind kind of, right? Mm -hmm. And then Elizabeth Spalke did these very beautiful experiments, right? Where I don't know whether you know of those, but where it's mm -hmm. like, um, uh, you know, this contraption where there's an object, a little cube behind this kind of flapping, um, you know, wooden board, right? Yeah. And the idea is the, the board comes up so that the infant cannot see the object behind anymore, but then the board goes all the way down, like flat. And when that happens, the the, the infant is surprised, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so looks longer than in the situation in which it stops at the time where, you know, the object is there, right? And yeah. so this kind of beautiful experiment shows that like, even from the very young age, right? Um, and I, again, unfortunately, I forgot exactly how old um, the children were, but very young. <laughs> um, they already have that sense of object permanence, right? And then in a similar way, they also have a sense uh, of continuity in, in motion, right? So that objects don't suddenly kind of like, you know, speed up and slow down and so on. And, and so there are these very basic building blocks that, um, that I think we start off with and then sort of, you know, bootstrap our way as we are sort of having direct experiences with the world, but also, you know, using our minds to think about the world, to build the more, you know, sophisticated knowledge of, of the world um, that we have later on. In a similar way, um, maybe in people's intuitive understanding of the psychological world, right? Um, even infants might already have a sense that um, agents are driven by goals, right? And, and desires, yeah. and that they tend to pursue those goals in efficient ways, right? That it's, if they want to get from A to B, they're not going to take some very roundabout way to get to A to B, or they would find that surprising, yeah. right? But then there's additional components to our intuitive um, understanding of psychology, such as the appreciation that people can have, you know, beliefs about the world, and that sometimes these beliefs might be wrong, but then we have false beliefs about the world, and that we can understand that somebody would act in a way um, that's, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, stupid, but but just because they know something different, right? And that appreciation like develops, you know, much later. But again, I think the assumption often is this, just as you put it, that there are certain core knowledge, um, uh, so certain things that come from very, very early on, and that we then just have a very powerful kind of general inference machine powered to a large extent, you know, by causality, that then allows us to build much more sophisticated um, theories of, of how the world works.
Mm -hmm. No, I, I am aware of, aware of those experiments done by Dr. Elizabeth Spelke. They are really yeah. fascinating. And I, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I haven't had the opportunity of having her on the show perhaps someday. But yeah, I, <laughs> I would really love to talk with her about them because they are really interesting. So yeah. uh, let me ask you another thing now. So what is causation by omission? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that phenomenon, right? So you can sort of contrast um, uh, commission. So that's sort of like st stuff happening. So like yeah. some event happens, like I, you know, somebody throws the ball at me and I hit it with the baseball bat and, you know, it flies through the air. You might say, okay, that's a yeah. case of, you know, um, causation by commission, right? But now let's take a different example, right? Somebody throws the ball at me, I miss it, right? I strike positive and the ball hits a window like in the you know and the window shatters like behind me right i was playing with my friend let's say um and now you might you might ask yourself like oh you know did the window shatter because toby missed the ball right um and so so here missing missing the ball right is like something that didn't happen right not hitting the ball how could that be a cause right of something that happens and intuitively we do that quite often though right we might say like okay you know, if I hit the ball like, you know, a hundred times now, every time the person, you know, lobbed it to me and on, on the one hundred and first time, the other person lobs the ball just as they do every time, but I miss it. Right. And it goes through through the window. You might think, like, yeah, that was the that was the cause. Right. And and not like the person who actually threw the ball. Right. Where you might say, like, OK, that's the kind of more process like cause. Right. Where from throwing the ball to like hitting the window, there's this kind of nice um, causal process. Right. That connects these events. Um, but nonetheless, we still might be more inclined to, you know, blame the person or say that it happened because of the person, in this case, me, who missed the ball, right? And so this is this kind of phenomenon, right? When is it that we would cite an, an omission, something not happening as a cause, right? The law also, again, does it, you know, very often. There's a notion of, of negligence, right? And negligence means like a person, you know, failed to do something that they should have done and something happened, you know, because of that. Um, there's some... Um, so, so it's certainly psychologically something we do, you know, all the time, right? It might not be, um, yeah, the kind of things, again, that are cited as causes, like in some sort of, you know, in the physical uh, world, although, of course, causation, like in physics is a separate sort of complicated um, uh, uh, problem. Um, but, but, but just to also highlight, like, one of the problems that arises with that is to say, like, okay, um, so let's say we are citing certain events of uh, certain omissions, like, as causes. And, and again, these kind of also counterfactual theories, they're kind of okay with that, right? Because you can say like, yeah, uh, it's Toby missing the ball that caused, you know, the window to shatter in this case. And, and what one might mean by saying that is like, had Toby not, you know, missed the ball, then everything would have been fine, right? Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, if we now allow for that, like, you know, why is it Toby missing the ball that caused the window to shatter and not like, you know, some other person missing the ball. Like there could have been someone else, right? You could have blocked it. Maybe the Queen of England could have been, you know, well, she's not alive anymore now. Maybe the King of England, you know, <laughs> the Queen of England was used as a standard example, I guess, but that needs to be revised now. <laughs> um, so the King of England could have hit the ball, right? In principle, you know, no reason not to. So the problem is that like, you know, uh, by allowing for omissions to count as causes, you arrive at what's sometimes called as kind of proliferation problem of causation, right? Because now every anything goes, right? Like, because mm -hmm. if you allow for omissions, you know, to be as causes, there's, there's an infinite a number of omissions at any given point in time, right? Um, and so then this question arises, like, okay, how do we pick out, you know, some omissions, um, but not others, right, as the, as the relevant um, causal factors? Mm -hmm. And there at least what sort of, you know, cognitive scientists have um, sort of, you know, um, come up with as the as a sort of natural explanation that covers um, many people's intu intuitions is that expectations are really critical for this case, right? So that we have expectations about how things you know should be done. Um, so these might be um, these might be prescriptive expectations, right? That's kind of yeah how it should be done. They might be or, or sort of normative expectations. They might be statistical expectations that are just based on how things, you know, tend to be, right? They might also be, sometimes they're called um, 
you know, functional norms or norms of proper functioning. That just means, again, it's not kind of prescriptive in the moral sense, but it's prescriptive in the like, you know, if you have some, you know, if you have your phone, the phone is supposed to work in a particular way, right? When I press that button, it's supposed to turn on, right? And if it didn't turn on, there would something be wrong about, you know, um, it's, it's, it's functioning. So it's these kind of normative expectations that affect um, what we think should happen. And when then, yeah. and then when this expectation is violated, um, and when we think that um, had the thing happened, you know, the outcome would have been different, then we might cite that um, as a cause, right? Mm -hmm. So just to give one, one other example, like someone's drowning in the ocean, right? And uh, nobody comes to, to help them, right? And, and now we say like, okay, you know, why did the person drown, right? If there was a lifeguard, you know, on the beach, right? And they didn't go, yes, definitely, like the lifeguard, it's the lifeguard's fault. This person drowned because, you know, the lifeguard didn't jump into the water because that's their job, right? They have the expectation of them to do that and them not doing it is something that I would count as a cause, you know, of this person um, a drowning. But if it's someone who can't swim, right? Who's also there, they also don't do anything, right? But I would not say that that's because of them, you know, that the other person, you know, drowned because they just didn't have, right, the capacity to, to do the relevant um, counterfactual thing. And so I would not right, um, judge that, yeah, this person drowned because this person who cannot swim, um, you know, didn't jump into the water because that wouldn't have been helpful. Then there would have been two people who drowned, right? And so, mm -hmm. so that's sort of like, um, so it's an interesting phenomenon, right? Causation by omission, it's counterfactual theories apply well to it, but uh, to, to deal with the problem of proliferation, we also then need to take into account the role that expectations play when people choose what things to, to cite as a cause. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess we're already getting here a little bit also into moral judgment and we'll come back to that in mm -hmm. a second. But I guess that uh, just to comment and perhaps this would be more of a philosophical comment than a psychological one because what, it, what matters here from the perspective of psychology is how people think and now and not how they should think or uh, if it's weird or not how people yeah. think. But it's actually I would, I would it's, say I would say a bit of both actually on that on that front, right? It's a, it's true that sometimes you know we might push the normative to the to the philosophers or so, mm. right? <laughs> Um, yeah. But I think also often, like, you know, in, in psychology, we, we ask these normative questions, right? Because, and that's interesting also for a phenomenon like causal judgment. It's like, you know, what's the point, right? You might ask, yeah. right? Why do we do this stuff in the first place, right? And can we be wrong about it, right? Because it feels yeah. like if this is something that we are kind of, you know, generally engaging it, then then hopefully it should play some kind of role, right? Like you were saying mm -hmm. earlier with um, maybe there is something um, useful about the capacity to um, uh, simulate counterfactuals because it helps us learn about the world, right? It helps us build better models of how the world works. It's certainly critical for uh, communicating well about the world. Again, if you ask yeah. me some kind of why question, it's very natural for me to answer it by referring to a counterfactual. Oh, this happened because of this and it wouldn't have happened otherwise. Mm -hmm. And this helps you now learn about the world. And that's, and that's a normative thing, right? I could then also say, Right? Oh, there's different possible, possible explanations that I could give. This one is better than some of the other ones. And what does it mean yeah. for it to be better in that case? Well, there's, there's a few options, but it could be like, it's better because you now have a better model in your mind of how the world works, right? Or, uh, or, or, or sort of, and or, um, you are now in a better position to take actions that allow you to pursue the goals that are relevant to you, right? And so in that yeah. sense, they're also... They're also normative, right? So I'm I'm certainly interested in that perspective because often it turns out if you have the right um, understanding of what the goal is that the cognitive system or the person is um, is is pursuing, that helps you, you know, um, describe the phenomenon well, right? So mm -hmm. I think they're kind of deeply connected. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Uh, I was just going to say with the example of let's say, a medical doctor that, yeah. uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, if you stop to think about it for, uh, for a bit, it's still perhaps a little bit weird why uh, through things like, for example, negligence, we would attribute causality to those mm. kinds of things. Because let's say that the doctor uh, makes the incorrect diagnosis and fails to deliver or provide the correct treatment and the person dies from cancer, yeah. let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I mean, the cause of death there is the cancer. It, it's not the doctor mm. failing to provide the treatment. I mean, the doctor, if the doctor had provided the treatment, it would have been the cause of the person living, right? Yeah, so, yeah. But, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's a bit yeah. weird. Right? No, no, yeah, you're right. It's a bit weird. It's, it's just like in the example also maybe that I had earlier with you know me me missing the the baseball, right? It's, you, somebody might say like, no, it's the person who threw the baseball, right? That's the <laughs> the cancer in your example. That's the cause of the window shattering, right? And of course, if if the, if there was no person you know standing there to hit the ball, of course that would be yeah. the case, right? Um, but but nonetheless, right? It's the world is complicated, right? And often outcomes um, are the result of many kind of let's say um, causes that are sort of like of the commission kind, right? Things that are actually, um, but then also like often a number of causes that might be of the omission kind, right? And it's partly mm -hmm. then um, two people might disagree, and that often often also happens, right? We may not disagree about the actual facts, right? We may say, like, okay, we we um, you know. When we disagree about something, it might be that we have different models of what happened. It might be it might be that we have different models of the world that influence um, how the counterfactuals might be different. But it could also be that we have exactly the same uh, understanding of what actually happened. We share exactly the same model um, such that if we were to think about certain counterfactuals, we would also agree. But nonetheless, we might still pick different causes, right? You might still mm -hmm. say like, yeah, I you know I share everything that you uh, think, but I think it was because of the cancer, and I think it was because of the doctor, right? And that might then have to do also partly with you know what it is that we want you know the person who we're talking to, for example, to focus on and 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 to potentially change and so on. So we're communicating maybe um, uh, our beliefs about what we take to be important in selecting um, specific causes. Mm -hmm. So that's the point where probably things like social norms or our own self-interests play a role, perhaps in the way that we are motivated to thinking about certain aspects of uh, causation. That's right. right. Yeah. And just to give one kind of, you know, um, um, you know, a terrible example that unfortunately comes up here, you know, in the U.S. quite frequently, take take the example of, you know, school shootings. That's a that's a mm -hmm. that, that's a terrible, you know, um, um, outcome, but then also whenever these things happen, right? You you see people; uh, they don't necessarily disagree about the facts. You know that yeah. okay, someone who um, you know um, had uh, certainly kind of mental um, you know mental issues and also had a gun, you know, uh, went into the school and 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 and, and shot others. Uh, but then the cause that people then you know cite as okay, why it is that this happened and what it is that we need to do about it. Those differ, right? With some people saying yeah. we need more strict gun laws, and then other people saying it's a mental health, you know, um, uh, crisis, right? And and so people don't disagree in some sense that both of these factors, you know, happen, but they give different explanations because, of course, they have their motivations about how they would like um, the world to change. And some people yeah. don't want any gun laws, so they cite the uh, mental health. And other people think it's it's terrible, you know, to have. Um, such loose gun laws, um, and it, and this kind of thing doesn't happen in other countries where other people also have mental health problems, and they cite a different cause. Right? And, and actually, ac yeah, actually, there's also people who think that we we would need even more guns because if the teachers were armed, That's next then level. Yeah, they would exactly. have prevented the shooting. That's doubling down in some sense, but yeah, you're right. That's another that's another way of responding. You know, yeah. So, but why is it that when there are several causes contributing to an outcome, I mean, how do people choose or single out one particular cause? And why is it that even uh, when they perhaps notice that there might have been different causes at play, they usually go for one single cause? Yeah. Let's be yeah, I think part of the things that we talked about, you know, touched on this question already, and it's partly also, yeah, what is the goal of that, right? There's some kind of why question that might often happen also in, in communication, right? It might be, I mean, sometimes it's possible that I ask um, this question like myself, right? It's like, oh, you know, I come... I come to the fridge, the door is open. It's like, oh, why is the fridge door open, right? Yeah. And then I think like, ah, oh, okay, it turns out, you know, the, the milk was a little bit tilted here. And so I, I put the milk back, close the fridge, done, right? I've solved the crime uh, in, in this case. 
but very often it's a it's a it's a communicative act right somebody asks me oh you know why did this happen and now and now i i get to choose what answer to give to that question right and um, and there's two things i think that we've uh, touched on that i think are particularly important to this choice right this is also like um um, um, a kind of phenomenon that sometimes in philosophy goes under the problem of causal selection, right? It's like, yeah, there's always a plethora of causes, um, but how do I, so sometimes one could put this in a way there's like, there's very many things that would count as a cause of the outcome, um, but we nevertheless pick just a few things, maybe sometimes just one as the cause of the outcome, right? To give one example, you might say like, you know, the Big Bang is a, is a cause of everything, right? But it's hardly ever the thing that we cite as the cause of something, right? <laughs> so we wouldn't say like, oh yeah, that window shattered because of the Big Bang. You know, that's not really a very satisfying um, explanation. So now what are the kind of things that determine how we choose um, to go from, you know, a cause to the cause, right? And the two things that we um, touched upon that I think are quite relevant here is on the one hand, yeah, the kind of normative expectations that we have, because uh, I am interested, right? When when somebody asks me a question, there's certain things that I can take for granted that I think like, okay, they definitely know that part already, right? So um, there's a classic example when, when like, let's say um, there's a wildfire and somebody dropped a match, you might say like, okay, you know, why, why was there a wildfire? Well, because somebody dropped the match, not because there was oxygen. Right. Even though if there hadn't been oxygen, you know, there wouldn't have been a wildfire. But it, that would be a weird thing to cite, right, in this kind of context, because I already assume that you know that there was oxygen present in the scene. Right. So partly it's that we tend to often cite um unusual events, like ab abnormal events, um, because we think that those are things that likely the other person doesn't already know. So I'm helping them by citing this cause and giving them a more accurate uh, kind of mental model of what happened. So that's one component, I think. Um, but there's also some research that has shown, and, and for a long time, uh, we, um, people thought, yeah, that's that's the thing, right? There's even like a, um, a, a book by um, um, Art and Honoré, so two um, legal legal scholars, causation and the law, um, where that's really the focus, right, of saying that, yeah, people focus on these abnormal events. There's some models also in psychology called the abnormal uh, focus condition model or something like that. And um, but then um, some colleagues of mine and, and also I myself at some point discovered that's not always actually what people choose as a cause. And I'm going to try to illustrate them um, the example here. And it's a little bit, um, you know, well, let me let me take this uh, this version of it. So there's two um, characters who um, who go into their office, let's say, at the same time, and. Um, and when um, and there's a kind of uh, motion detector in the office, maybe the one that just like turns the turns the light on, you know, in the office. And this is either set up in a way such that um, it turns on when you know either of the people like turn up, so it only needs one, you know, to turn on the motion detector, or it needs two people to turn on this motion detector. And now, like in some day, like the the, the boss tells one of the people, um, say Ricardo, he tells Ricardo, tomorrow don't come into the office, right? And then, and then he tells um, Toby, "Come, come into the office. You know, so I'm supposed to go. You're not supposed to go. Now we both turn up, uh, but nonetheless, we both turn up, right? And the and the motion detector turns on. And then you ask people, okay, why did the motion detector turn on? You know, was it because of you know Ricardo, or was it because of Toby? But we didn't give them the option to say like it was because of both in this case, just to see whether they would have a preference between the two." And, and what turns out is that in, in conjunctive scenarios where both of us are needed to make the outcome happen, people have a strong preference for the abnormal cause. So that would have been you in this case who wasn't supposed to turn up, right? But when it's a disjunctive scenario, so that means that either of the causes, it's individually sufficient to make it happen. So it just needs one of us to turn up to make this motion detector turn on. In that case, they actually sec select me as the cause. So the one who was supposed to turn up, right? And so we were puzzled by this for a while, like, oh, why is it that in certain uh, causal structures, people select the normal event as the cause, and in other structures, they select the abnormal event as the cause. And our idea was here is that they're, in addition, right, to often like wanting to communicate something that's, um, you know, unknown to the other person, which drives us generally towards mentioning abnormal events, we also care about um, equipping the other person with the kind of knowledge that's useful for them to take good actions in the world, 
And this again relates back a little bit also to our sort of, you know, school shooting example. Like the reason for why people might choose one or the other is not, it's not that they're communicating something that the other person doesn't already know, but they're differing in their beliefs about what the good actions are, the things that we should change, right? And, and bringing it back to this example of the multiple causes, it's, it's, it, it turns out, and it might be a little bit tricky to go into the details here without, you know, um, being able to sort of, you know, draw and show stuff, but it turns out that, um, uh, generally, if you want the other person to, um, if you think that what the other person wants to to be is be in a situation where they can make a difference to the outcome, right? Where they can take action such that, oh, if I want to make it happen, I should focus on this. If I want to prevent it from happening, I should focus on that. So telling you about the normal event in the destructive um, um, situation puts you in a better position to make a difference because that's the thing that you want to focus on. Because for example, if you want to make it happen, it doesn't matter which of the two you make happen in a disjunctive um, situation. But if you want to prevent it from happening, you really want to focus on the thing that normally happens. And so, so this is the sort of like second key component, I think that, that I've at least, you know, um, and others have come up with is say, yeah, when choosing how to, um, how to choose among all those things that were causes of the outcome, which ones to cite, well, the ones that will are useful for you to, um, you know, updating your beliefs about, you know, what happened or how the world works, and then the ones that are helpful for you if you had to, if you found yourself in a situation like that and you wanted to uh, take good actions, I'll I'll point out to you that I think um, uh, is the is the most useful one. Right? And then again, mm -hmm. one other interesting thing that that maybe um, relates to is that from some from an explanation that somebody chooses. You can make inferences about, you know, their beliefs about how the world works and also their motivations, right? Bringing it back to the example, right, of the of the of the school shooting. If somebody cites, you know, mental health as a problem, as the cause, you know, of the school shooting, that tells you something about them, right? It tells you something about what their motivations are, how they think the world works, what they think um, should be changed, right? And so we can make inferences. Um, about the person, about their beliefs, about their goals, uh, from the explanations that they give. Actually, that bit about motivations also, I guess, played a big role during the pandemic when people were talking about uh, dying of COVID or dying yeah. with COVID. Like, for example, yeah. there were many people that were against the lockdowns and the vaccines mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. safety measures that whenever uh, people on the news were talking about uh, new deaths from COVID, uh, they were like, oh, oh, yeah, from those deaths, how many of them were people who were obese or people who yeah, had cancer? Yeah. Because it yeah. was then mm. the obesity or the cancer that killed yeah, them yeah. or not COVID. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are, again, yeah, those are also super interesting questions and they, and they're, they're sort of then these sort of like disjunctive scenarios also that cause some problems actually for simple counterfactual theories because you, in your setting, right, it might very well be like, yeah, this person would have died anyhow, right? But now that doesn't mean that we don't want to cite any of these things like as a cause. I'll give another kind of gruesome example of, of this uh, scenario. So so take a take a firing squad, right, where, where several people are shooting, you know, one person, you know, to, uh, to kill them. And now, according to some simple counterfactual theory, each of them might say like, well, I wasn't the cause of the person's death, right? Because if I hadn't shot, the person would still have died anyhow, right? Because this is a situation in which the outcome is causally overdetermined, where there are many um, causes that are individually already sufficient to make the outcome happen, right? And of mm -hmm. course, and this is sometimes uh, raised also as a problem, you know, for counterfactual theories, right? Um, but people have, you know, addressed that, right, by saying that, okay, maybe the simple counterfactual theory is insufficient in these kinds of cases. So it's not just like imagining if the person hadn't done something, um, but you have to expand it and think about, okay, what are possible counterfactual contingencies under which the person's action could have made a difference, right? And so, and there's, and these accounts have then been sort of, you know, worked out that make it such that, yeah, in the scenario, it's still the case that each person, you know, counts as a cause of the outcome. But we might also have, and this relates a little bit to, you know, what we were saying we were going to get it at some point, you know, like responsibility and morality. We might still have a sense that their that their degree of responsibility is reduced in such settings, right? That like when outcomes are strongly overdetermined, so this could happen in the firing squad, but it could also happen in, in elections, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it might make quite a big difference, right? If you think like 
let's take a small election, right? If the outcome uh, was, you know, 10 against one versus the outcome was six versus five, right? If it was six versus five, then each person probably feels a high degree of responsibility for the outcome because if they just had voted differently, the outcome would have changed. Whereas if it's 10 to one, then each of the person doesn't maybe feel as responsible because it would have needed a few other people, right? Uh, to change their mind such that they would have been in the position that they could have changed the outcome, right? And mm -hmm. so- so, so yeah, so those things I think are um, uh, are interesting, like that that you pointed out in the COVID example, right? Those were ex examples of where outcomes were potentially causally overdetermined, right? And again, now you have a little bit of a choice, but right? you can say, oh, I choose this one. And somebody says, well, I choose that one, right? And so, mm -hmm. yeah. So before we get specifically into moral judgment and how people attribute moral, uh, I mean, how basically they attribute moral responsibility, uh, I have just one more thing that I wanted to ask you about. You've also done work on how people learn about causal structure in a continuous time setting. So could you tell us about that? First of all, what is a continuous time setting and then what do you study there specifically? Yeah. Yeah. So this is much more in the in the branch, right? That I mentioned at the beginning. I mentioned these sort of, you know, three different uh, domains, right, of causal cognition, the causal learning part, the causal reasoning part, and the causal judgment part. Um, most of my work has focused on the causal judgment explanation part, also a little bit on the causal reasoning part. Like um, yeah. that we have some work on how people can make inferences about what happened by using evidence from different sense modalities, like so more like Sherlock Holmes, like um, you know, vision and sound. And in the causal learning domain, I've primarily worked with a, a colleague of mine. Um, he's a professor at um, or lecturer at University of Edinburgh, Neil Bramley. Um, and, and he has done a really a lot of great work. Um, and, and, and in this case, some of the work that I'm going to be talking about is with his um, PhD student, um, Tia Wong, Tia Gong, um, and um, uh, on sort of causal learning in continuous time, right? Um, so there the idea is, right, so, so some of the work in causal learning in psychology has taken this kind of uh, format where people get data that's kind of like in a contingency table, right? You see like sort of discrete chunks, right? It's like, you know, here are observations of, you know, let's say day one are this, observations of day two are this, or day three are this, and maybe not even with days, just like these kind of independent kind of, you know, discrete samples. And, and there's the realization that at least, again, like you were saying, we, ra we rarely do RCTs in our everyday life. Like our experience is not quite like that, right? When we interact with the world, of course, we experience the world in continuous time. That just means like that time is not discrete, right? It's just sort of, you know, ticking or yeah um um and um and, and 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 that often we don't know kind of when when let's say the first trial ends and the second trial begins that's what we have in an experiment but in the real world we don't know right if i'm again trying to figure out you know why why my stomach is upset you know i don't know was it because of something that i ate you know yesterday or or two days ago or because i'm stressed or right there's many many things and i sometimes don't know exactly uh, what the delays are between like some some cause right and and the effect and that makes um, that makes this a very challenging problem right to make causal inferences in in continuous time and so um, but then yeah with Neil and Tia we sort of you know tackled tackled that problem um, by using again this kind of paradigm that's quite often used in causal learning where you think of some kind of um, graph structure so you have sort of separate variables from the graphs. And what you're trying to figure out is how those variables are connected to one another, right? Is it like that A causes B or that B causes A and so on. But now in the setting, right, we could, we we observed the activations of those variables or which are just little blobs like on the screen, you know, the participants would see uh, in continuous time. So something would put up, something else would pop up and so on. So you would see these kind of like, you know, patterns of things flashing. Um, and you were trying to figure out, okay, you know, what causes what here? And it's a challenging problem. And But we allowed participants also in that setup to then um, uh, take interventions. So make one of the blobs, you know, cause it yourself, right? And also interventions that would turn things off, right? So you could say like, no, I don't want, I want to turn this part off now, the system and turn this one on. And, and there's a lot of details like in kind of, you know, what it is that we found, but I just sort of highlight um, a few things. Um, it turns out this is the kind of paradigm where, where then uh, in terms of causal learning, people hit like a limit in what it is that they can process like, you know, relatively quickly. So if you take some kind of, you know, normative model here that doesn't have any 
um, kind of memory constraints, you know, perceives everything, then for, for such a model, like more stuff is always better, right? So it's sort of, um, it, cause, cause, cause it can it can tease everything um, apart and it can, um, mm -hmm. whereas for, for a human learner, that's not necessarily true, right? It's like, um, it's sort of like, you know, when you drink from a, from a fire hose, right? And you, all the water splashes in your face, you're not going to be able to drink from it, but right? you'd have to sort of sip a little bit from the side, right? To actually be able to drink water from, from, a, from a fire hose. And that's what we saw roughly what people were doing in a paradigm like that, right? They were really orchestrating the evidence by sort of preventing things from happening in such a way such that um, they would get um, a good amount of information that they could still deal with, right? To make inferences about the underlying structure, um, but would not be overwhelmed with information such that they wouldn't be able to um, process it anymore. So this was sort of um, one of the high level findings that we had um, in, in that kind of work. Mm -hmm. So let's get into responsibility here then. Mm -hmm. So how does causal cognition, basically everything we've been talking about here, connect to how people attribute responsibility to other people? Yeah. Yeah. So that I think very quite closely connected um to, to one another. And 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 I personally, at least when I when I think about um responsibility, I think that there are at least like two higher level questions or kind of key questions that we um kind of need to ask ourselves when thinking about the extent to which we think somebody um you know is responsible for some outcome. And one is really sort of just the causal question, right? It's just saying like, okay, to what extent do I believe that the actions that they took, right, caused this negative outcome to happen, right? And there we're just back to kind of, you know, a counterfactual world. Um, and, 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 but also kind of counterfactual world, of course, becomes a little bit more difficult when we now have, you know, people as the target where we're trying to think about, as opposed to, again, some physical object or so. Because when we're thinking about a physical object, Maybe it's the counterfactual that comes to mind is sort of natural. Well, what if that object hadn't been there? But when we think about people as causes, it's not necessarily clear that the right counterfactual is them not having been there, right? If I think, for example, about, um, oh, to what extent is, you know, Steph Curry, the um, point guard of the, of the Warriors, and to what extent is he responsible, you know, for the performance of the Warriors? It's not that you're going to think like, okay, what would have happened if they had played four against five instead, right? Just removing him, you know, from from the scene. But maybe the right kind of um, counterfactual in this case, and my my um, my student Sarah Wu has done some great work on that by thinking about like, the counterfactual operation here as an operation of replacement, right? Thinking about well, what would have happened because replacement seems the relevant counterfactual intervention here because we know how basketball works is like if one player is not there they're replaced with someone else, right? And then the idea is like, how well would they have done, you know, with this person? Mm -hmm. um, so, so the causal analysis becomes more complicated potentially when we think about people, but nonetheless, I think that um, counterfactual theories are still like a key part to answering that causal question. So that's one key component. What causal role did the person's action play in bringing about the outcome? And then a second key component, I believe, is what the action actually tells us about the person, right? And there, sort of our intuitive psychology is critical, right? So we, we of course, don't get to observe people's mental states, you know, directly. All we get to see is the actions that they take, you know, the words that they say and so on. But from those, we can make inferences because again, we have a causal understanding of how people work, right? Where at least a simple kind of intuitive theory of psychology is something along the lines of like, okay, people have beliefs and desires and maybe they form intentions as part of that, and those intentions bring about actions, right? And so now if, if I observe some action, and maybe I know something about what the beliefs of the person are, that allows me to make inferences about what their desires must have been, right? And so if I believe that this action um, that I observed somebody taking is actually indicative of a bad desire, right? Like, oh, they wanted for this negative outcome to happen, then this is also something that uh, will contribute to my assessment of responsibility. Right. It's saying like um, intuitively, right, if something happens accidentally as an outcome, I really like, oh, yeah, they were the cause, but they didn't want that. Right. I'm not going to attribute them as much responsibility than when I believe that they actually brought this about intentionally. They wanted for this to happen. Um, and so I think these two components are sort of critical when thinking about responsibility. There may be other factors, but those are things that I have um, focused on in, in, in my research. Uh, and what about specifically evaluating uh, or 
re, I, I mean, attributing moral judgments to people e, in function uh, of their knowledge. I mean, if they were knowledgeable or if they were ignorant, I mean, basically what they knew beforehand, does that matter to how we hold them responsible for a particular negative outcome? Yeah, it certainly does. Right? And I think it actually affects both of those components, right? Um, because so the components right about what sort of counterfactuals come to mind, as yeah. well, which which uh, are relevant to the causal assessment of what what you know what role the action played, as well as the kind of inferences that I make about the person, right? Mm -hmm. For the first part, right, the counterfactuals that come to mind about you know what they could have done differently will differ depending on if I if I believe that they knew, right? If they if I believe that they knew uh, what the consequences of their action are, right? Then I think like mm -hmm. well. Why did you do that? You should have done something differently, right? If I believe that they were ignorant about what the consequences of their actions, you know, would be, then there's no reason to kind of see them in that sense as the cause of the outcome because it's not like, you know, they didn't know. So it's not like they, they um, it's a natural thought to think about, oh, they should have done something different, right? So the, so the knowledge component influences what counterfactuals come to mind when assessing the causal role. And it also matters for the kind of inferences that we make about the person, right? Because again, if we know that somebody knew that this would have a negative consequence, that this would harm someone, and they did it nonetheless, well, that tells me that they wanted that, that they wanted that to happen, or that they were at least willing, you know, to make it happen. Whereas if somebody did not know that this was going to harm someone, I'm not licensed to make that inference, right? I can still think like, oh, they actually didn't know that was going to happen. They didn't want for this to happen. So, so on both of those, uh, both for both of those parts, right? Knowledge is sort of um, uh, really critical. And one interesting kind of um, project also that I kind of quickly, um, you know, give a shout out to here on that front is from my um, uh, from my postdoc Lara Kierfel. She's looked at at willful ignorance. So this is an interesting phenomenon, right? Where somebody is, you know, willingly ignorant. Right. Um, and, you know, maybe some of us can kind of, you know, resonate with that idea. Maybe some of us has, have sort of, you know, um, you know, in, in, in Germany, if you take the, you know, the underground in um, in Berlin, like, you know, you, you can board without a ticket. Right. And you could try and get away with saying, oh, I didn't know you needed a ticket. I mean, you're probably not going to get away with that. Right. Because, um, you know, in this case, like the ignorance doesn't protect you from from the punishment in this case. Uh, but nonetheless, it sometimes feels like, yeah, we, we, we are shielding ourselves from certain knowledge. We don't want to know certain things, partly because maybe sometimes we might think that um, um, if I knew that, uh, that might give me a reason not to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so so for one example is like people might a lot of people might be quite willfully ignorant about, you know, how how, you know, a cow is being turned into a steak, right? <laughs> so they know it's happening, right? But they don't necessarily yeah. want to see the process, right? Because they really like eating steaks and they feel like having the relevant knowledge of how this happens might make them enjoy the steak somewhat less, right? Um, mm -hmm. And th th there's many sort of, you know, phenomenon uh, like that. And so we were just interested, right, in how, how people attribute responsibility to willfully ignorant agents, right? So agents that... Um, uh, make it such that they don't know, right? And we find mm -hmm. that it does attenuate the responsibility attribution, like to some extent, um, but it's not like the same, on the same level as somebody who is, you know, ignorant. So without, you know, having um, um, having sort of taken actions to get into that um, position of, of ignorance. So, so yeah, in short, you know, uh, the states of knowledge are key, right? For both of those components and um, yeah, Willful ignorance is this interesting intermediate state that 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 I at least and uh, have only started to explore. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there's an element of plausible deniability here when it comes to willful ignorance, because if you actually don't know, even though perhaps you suspect that you should try to learn about that specific thing, perhaps it's easier for you to deny responsibility. Right. That you're, you're exactly right. That's one key motivation that we think for why sometimes people may choose to be willfully ignorant, right? They might they yeah. might choose it in a situation where they they're pretty sure, you know, what it would be, but they don't want to know for sure, such that when it happens, they can be in the situation of plausible deniability and then say like, "Well, I didn't know," right? And so that might be, and and that only works, right? Uh, because of course, people are sensitive to knowledge, right? The fact mm -hmm. that 
that could in principle count as an excuse, right? That you didn't know already shows that, um, right? That's a relevant component when people are attributing, you know, um, when people are making moral judgments or attributing responsibility. Uh, I imagine that probably one of the darker examples of that would be someone who suspects that they might be infected with an STI, but then they don't test for it because yeah. they want to keep having yeah. sex yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I mean, just partying without yeah. Yeah. Uh, assuming responsibility for yeah. uh, what they might do to other yeah. people. That's that's right. Or or also like COVID again is another example, right? So you you suspect that you might have it, you know, you have a cold, you're coughing, but there's this event that you really want to go to, right? And so you're not going to do the test because you don't want to find out, right? And then it feels, and then you sort of feel like, oh, I didn't know, you know, that I have it. And whereas, of course, if you did do the test and you found out you had it, you might feel like, oh, now it feel even more shitty, you know, to go. So this is another kind of example that probably uh, people can kind of, you know, relate to. So you mentioned intentions earlier. Tell us a yeah. little bit more about that. What role does an agent's intentions play in the evaluation of moral permissibility, basically? Yeah, so intentions, I think, are really key, right? So intentions give us about, give us information. Again, often we don't, we don't know it directly, right? We just know what action somebody took. But intention is the idea is, okay, that's the thing that they, that they wanted to bring about, right? That was the goal, like, of their action. And, um, and so um, to kind of give maybe a little bit of a sort of intuition about how we can tell, you know, one thing apart from another, right? So we can say like, okay, if somebody takes some action, there might be like an intended consequence of that action. So that's the, that's the outcome that they want to make happen. That's the, that's the, the cause of them acting in that way. And there might also be certain side effects that are happening from the action that they're taking. But those side effects were not necessarily intended. Right. Those were just like things that they also foresaw maybe would happen. Um, um, and so so in the in the case, unfortunately, we have a lot of you know wars going on at the moment uh, now. So what you might say, oh, intended things are like, you know, harming like the enemy and then side effects would be harming civilians. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not what you want to do. But certain actions like on, you know, the enemies cannot be taken without, you know, also um, bringing about the, the unintended side effect in this case. Yeah. And, and how can we tell apart, at least in principle, kind of what's what, right? The idea is here that you can, again, use a counterfactual analysis. Um, and, but now the counterfactual is applied, like, you know, because now it's in our mind, right? Like the intention is, is a mental state, right? The counterfactual is not applied now in some sense, you know, to something in the world, like to the relationship between like the action and the outcome, but rather to the relationship between um, um, yeah, the the intended outcome in the world and the kind of decision, the plan that the person made. So the idea is that if you want to tell apart um, from you know what somebody did, what was intended and what wasn't, the intended thing is the thing that makes a difference to the person's decision or to the person's plan, right? Such that if that had been different, the person would have taken a different decision, would have taken a different action. Whereas the side effect, that's not the thing that changes the person's kind of decision or plan, right? And so um, with my colleague, Max Kleimanweiner, we've explored this in the context of sort of, you know, trolley dilemmas. So that's a very, you know, uh, common, um, you know, uh, paradigm in, in moral psychology, right? That maybe yeah. most people are familiar with where there's a runaway trolley and then somebody has to decide whether or not to turn a switch where the switch would redirect the trolley, right? If they don't turn the switch, um, the people who are on the main track, you know, would die. Maybe there's five people like on the main track, you know, who, who would die. Um, and but if, if the person turns the switch, then the trolley is redirected to a side track, and then somebody on that side track is gonna die. And so now let's take maybe like the standard, one of the standard scenarios. There's five people on the main track and there's one person on the side track. And maybe I'll ask you in this case, would it be permissible for let's call him Hank in this case? Would it be permissible for Hank to throw the switch in that scenario? What do you think? Uh. I, I, I'm not a good test subject for, <laughs> for these kinds of thought experiments because I, I'm usually, I, I mean, if people ask me, oh, if you pull the switch or something like that uh, and you deviate the the direction Probably. of the trolley toward one person, uh, otherwise it would have been five. I'm just like, oh, but I have nothing to do with that. Let it just kill the five people. 
Yeah, yeah. So so that's that's a very common response where people don't want to, you know, play God, right? They don't want to interfere <laughs> when it is about decisions of life and death, right? And they say, yeah. like, okay, I'm just gonna close my eyes, you know, and let nature do its thing, kind of, right? Yeah. Um, so that would be an omission also, right, that you would prefer in this case. I just don't want to act, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, in general, though, like if you if you make the scenario in this kind of way and Hank, you know, and, and you ask people, is it morally permissible for Hank to throw the switch? Most people do say in the scenario, yes, it is morally permissible, right? Um, of course, if you flipped like how many people are on the different tracks, definitely not permissible, not permissible for him to change it, you know, from one person to five, right? Yeah. Um, so, but then part is like also here, like, okay, what was the intention, right? What was the desire of Hank um, that that underlied that decision, right? And yeah. presumably the intention was to save the five, right? Mm -hmm. The intention was not to kill the one, even right. though in some sense, right, the action is consistent with both of those things. If Hank had wanted to kill the one, right? And you could change the scenario. Maybe the, maybe the one person is this absolutely horrible person, right? Who, if they're gonna survive, are gonna cause a lot of trouble in the world, right? So now the same scenario, you might not say, well, actually uh, it is more permissible still, but now the reason I think for why they did it was maybe to save the five, right? But partly really to kill the one, right? And, yeah. and the difference, right? That you could see between these two scenarios is like, imagine the five hadn't been there, right? If your intention was to save the five, in this case, you would not change the trolley, right? Because now, you know, the reason for you acting is not there anymore. Whereas if your intention was to kill the one, right, in the scenario where the horrible person is on track one, now you would still, even if the five weren't there, you would still switch it, right? And so um, so this is kind of this idea, right, that like you can, you can try to um, infer what somebody intended to happen by thinking about what were the, the outcomes of their decisions that actually affected, you know, their planning, the way that they made their decision. And, and then I think about um, from that, right, that affects whether I take the action to be more morally permissible. So for moral permissibility, yeah. it's like, what inferences can I make about what it is that they intended? And then I also care about um, actually sort of, again, the consequences of their action, similar to when I was saying in responsibility, right? It's sort of the, the causal role that the action played and what it is that the action told me about them. So in this case, right, the, the, the causal consequence is kind of how many people died. And in general, you want fewer people to die. <laughs> um, and then what does it tell me like about the person in this case, what it is that they intended um, uh, to happen? Well, it just came to my mind. This never crossed my mind before that when you were talking about intentions and diverting the trolley from the five people track to the one person track. What if there was someone like a psychopath that was like, oh, now I have the opportunity of killing one person and I will get away with murder <laughs> because it will be me causing the, the person. Yeah, 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 you're right. And and if that's, the, again, you know, if that's the person, right, you think like, okay, well, I'm not sure how permissible that is, right? Because <laughs> in some sense, you know, it didn't change anything about, and it's interesting related to, right, like this this idea now with the with the psychopath, right? And often, you know, there's this, these, these things are sometimes set up in a way that such that, you know, utilitarian principles, so principles yeah. about, you know, trying to bring, you know, the greatest good to the, you know, most people, or in mm -hmm. this case, avoiding harm, you know, to the most people come in conflict with, um, other principles like deontological principles of you know moral action that pertain more to like uh, following certain rules like you know th thou shalt not kill right yeah and and sometimes there's this interesting conflict right there might be certain actions that are from a utilitarian perspective potentially justifiable right but at the same time, it would be pretty, you know, gruesome to do, right? Yeah. Um, there's one example of that kind, again, there might not be a great example, but it could be like, oh, you know, there's five people who need organs, right? And then there's one mm -hmm. person and you just, you know, kill that person to give the organs to the other people and save the five, right? Um, so, you know, maybe that's not justifiable on any perspective, but you could at least see in principle from a utilitarian calculus that, that it could be the kind of thing that could be justifiable, right? But it also would be really psychopath style right for someone to you know to to do that right and so so there's sometimes this um disconnect between like okay you know uh, and and some studies have shown that that they might think like okay yeah that's a more morally permissible thing to do in a situation but i would not want to be their friend <laughs> if that makes sense right so and that's a disconnect right, between again the two components right the sort of causal role okay maybe that's good 
But the inference that I make about the person is like, yeah, they're kind of a psychopath. So that's not the kind of person who I would want to be with, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so those yeah. things also happen for, for moral judgments. Yeah, because actually the outcome is very different uh, in the, the two scenarios. But yeah. th there's this very strong intuition that if uh, something that you didn't do, you didn't put the people on the tracks and you didn't yeah. put yeah. Uh, the trolley running. I mean, you have nothing to do with that. But if you pull yeah. the lever, now you have something to do with it. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And it's again, there's a lot of work, right, showing that in these kind of situations, people often yet yeah, default to not, you know, to omitting, right, to not wanting to do mm -hmm. anything about it. Uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, I guess that we could say here then that, and this is very counterintuitive, but there's somewhat of a relationship between intuitive physics and intuitive psychology on the one hand and moral judgment on the other hand. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure how counterintuitive that is. Hopefully not. <laughs> but, um, but my sense is, right, that, yeah. In many, you know, everyday situations, even like, I mean, the trolley is sort of a simple one because maybe my intuitive physical understanding here is not, you know, strained all that much, but still, you know, you needed it, right? I needed to be able to tell you that the trolley was going to go this way and otherwise it would go that way and that there was a switch, you know, that would make the difference. So, so in many situations, right, when we are at least in our sort of embedded in our everyday lives, we, we don't get um, sometimes, let's say, this kind of stylized information that we might use, you know, in, in vignettes or scenarios in a, in a psychology experiment, right? We have to derive that information from seeing people interact, you know, in, in the physical world. And, um, and a, lot of, a lot of factors, you know, are of relevance and play out in these situations. Take, for example, like a notion of a capacity or ability that somebody might have. We touched a little bit on that, again, in a sort of discrete stylized version of it with the lifeguard right that's an ability right that the person has or doesn't have um um but again you know it's a simple example but i need to bring together right my physical understanding namely somebody jumping in the water and being able to swim right with my kind of intuitive psychological uh, exp um, understanding right it's like okay mm. what can somebody do and what they were supposed to do right and now you could imagine right just kind of in not necessarily a nice experiment in this case, but again, a plausible one, you know, manipulate how far it is that the person is away, you know, from the beach when they're drowning, right? And so you could now think about, okay, was this something that the person, you know, could have achieved, right? Um, and so there's sort of physical knowledge that comes to bear, like on this question, um, that combines, right, with the, mm -hmm. with the psycho psychological knowledge, or again, maybe in a non-moral do domain, but something that at least some of the uh, listeners, particularly maybe the American ones, can kind of relate to. Um, so counterfactuals also come up there in in, in many sports. So there's a um, there's a there's a um, there's a foul like in American football called you know pass interference, and mm -hmm. and what that foul is like if it basically is when the you know when the quarterback and I know relatively little about uh, about American football, but this is one thing hopefully that I get roughly right. So yeah, when I, I'm also more about soccer, soccer slash yeah, normal right. football. Let's yeah, say. yeah. So kind of actually has come out there too, but like, you know, I'll <laughs> use this example for now. So the quarterback throws the ball, right? And then the receiver, before the receiver catches the ball, um, the defender is not allowed to interfere with the receiver. So they're not allowed to like kind of push them. They can try to, you know, catch the ball, but they're not allowed to interfere with the receiver. But now, and and pass interference is the foul call when the when the referees believe that the defender actually interfered uh, with the receiver before the receiver was able to kind of catch the ball, right? But now, importantly, it's only pass interference when the receiver could have caught the ball, right? So that's a counterfactual, right? So and that's a call for the referees to decide, like, yeah, that's the kind of ball that the receiver could have, in principle, caught, and only if that's the case is it a foul. Right. So again, this is not necessarily moral reasoning in this case here, but it sort of brings to mind that like, yeah, our ability to think about how people are interacting with each other in the physical world, what kind of abilities they have, because even like in the pass interference call, right, uh, it might be pass interference for, you know, some expert football player that wouldn't have been pass interference for me because I'm slow, right? And whereas this person is really fast. So thinking about what that person could have done is different from what I could have done. And that brings together, again, the knowledge of the physical world and our knowledge of people to simulate what these relevant counterfactuals would have looked like. 
And so, so they really come together when deciding um, uh, about whether it's, whether what's morally permissible or not, um, mostly through this mechanism of thinking about what the possibilities are, what the person could have achieved, could not have achieved, what they should have done, should not have done, and so on. Great. So, Dr. Gerstenberg, I think that this would probably be a good point to end the interview on. Uh, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? And I don't know if you also want to mention what you're working on at the moment. So Yeah, sure. So, so you can find me on the internet. I mean, probably just by Googling uh, my name, right? I'm also on, on Twitter at uh, X now, I guess it's called, with, uh, the handle Toby Gerstenberg. And I'm also on Blue Sky. So those are places you can find me. My lab, the Causality and Cognition Lab, also has a YouTube channel. You know, once this is out, I think I will uh, link to it um, as well. Um, so those are places where you can find about find out about, you know, myself and, and, and my work. And then in terms of things that we're currently working about, one, one area that I didn't, you know, get to talk so much in our um, um you know, right now, but that I'm excited about is more on the kind of you know, we, we mostly talked about the causal learning and the causal judgment part, but I've also been uh, quite interested in the causal reasoning part. And there's a bigger project that we're interested in is really in how people, you know, how people are sort of like intuitive detectives sometimes, like Sherlock Holmes or Miss Marple, and how they can draw on different sources of evidence often. So there's visual evidence, but sometimes also we have auditory evidence, the kind of sounds, you know, that happened. Um, and how we can use these different pieces of information to figure out what happened in the past. So just to give you maybe like one intuitive example. So imagine that you, um, you know, the person who you live with, you know, your partner or roommate or something does something in the kitchen. You just hear the sounds. But based on the sounds, you know exactly what it is that they're doing. Right. You might even know exactly what it is that they're cooking just by hearing like, oh, they're going to the fridge now. They're picking up these things. Oh, I can hear they're cracking the eggs Oh, they're making an omelet, you know. Um, so all this stuff, in some sense, all you have is just the sounds, but be, because you know kind of your kitchen and you know what people roughly do, you can kind of reconstruct in your mind what it is that they're doing um, by combining these auditory information with your intuitive theory of how the world works. And that's something that I'm quite um, excited about, kind of studying that and understanding that better, what the limits are of people doing it doing that and how they draw yeah, from these different sense modalities to figure out what happened by mentally simulating possibilities in their mind. So that's one of the things that I'm quite excited about. Great. So thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been really fun to talk with you. Awesome. Yeah, I had a great time. Thanks so much, Ricardo. <laughs> Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com and also please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perergo Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf, Alex, Adam Castle, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Erika Lenny, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Ruinasi, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Phil Gavana, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel Andre, Francis Forti, Agnun, Svergal Kossen, Hal Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Labyrinth, John Linares, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, John Leira, Tom Hamel, Sardis, Franz David Sloan, Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Puntara, Dana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Stasevski, Nelek Bakka, Madison, Gary G. Alman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentin, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, George Stéphanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles de Murray, Alex Shaw, Maury Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilley Jr., Old Erringbone, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracie, Zigoren, Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dovner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandon, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crowley, Kate Van Goller, Alexander Hubbard, uh, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hertner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings, David Pinsoff, Sean Nelson, Mike Lavigne, and Dios Necht, uh, 
A special thanks to my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Igni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Giancarlo Montenegro, Alni Cortiz and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, Bogdan Canivets and Rosie. Thank you for all.